Okay, I think that's five past. So we'll just get started and then um, more people might join us um, as I kind of run through the introduction. Um, so good evening, everyone, and welcome to the latest event in our Spotlight series. Uh, tonight we have Spotlight on Animal Law um, with the Scottish Young Lawyers Association and the UK Centre for Animal Law. My name is Kerry Montgomery and I am one of the committee members of the Scottish Young Lawyers Association. Um, just before we get started, um, if I could ask everyone um, to um, pop any questions that you've got um, throughout the, the, the webinar this evening into the Q&A function as opposed to the chat function um, and we will get to those as we run through the evening. So I'm delighted to introduce our panel this evening who are all representatives of the UK Centre for Animal Law. Um, so tonight you're going to hear from Paula, Paula Sparks, who is the chairperson of the UK Centre for Animal Law. Paula was previously in practice as a barrister and is now a visiting lecturer at the University of Winchester, where she teaches animal law and policy. Paula regularly lectures and writes on topics around animal law and policy, um, and I think is the expert to hear from this evening. You'll also hear from Hannah Darnell, who is a multidisciplined Scottish solicitor um, with experience in real estate, planning law, criminal law and consumer rights. Um, and Hannah is currently focusing on private client matters at the moment. Um, Hannah is a member of the Scottish Steering Group and Wildlife Working Group. Um, and she was previously appointed as Animal Ambassador for Willows Animal Sanctuary and Animal Assisted Therapy Unit in Aberdeenshire, which is Scotland's largest animal sanctuary. Tiffany Mitchell is going to chair the panel for us this evening. Tiffany is the UK Centre for Animal Law's Legal Support Officer. She provides student support and academic outreach, as well as providing support for ALAW's other project policy and edu educative work. Tiffany is originally from Newfoundland in Canada, where she graduated with a BA in Law and Society before earning a certificate in Criminology in Germany and an LLB from the University of Leicester. We're very grateful to the UK Centre for Animal Law for giving their time tonight and I'm sure this is going to be a really enjoyable and interesting presentation. So thank you all so much for joining us for this latest SYLE event and without further ado I'll pass over to Tiffany. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie, and welcome everyone. Um, thank you for such a warm welcome um, and to you and Kira for organizing this fantastic event. I'm so pleased to see so many people here interested in learning about animal law and how to better the lives of non-human animals that we share this big planet with. Um, just before we get started and I hand over to the speakers, um, as Carrie said, please pop any questions that you have into the Q&A box so that we can um, easier manage your questions. Um, but without further ado, I will hand over to Hannah um, to begin this evening before we um, hand over to Paula to get um, to learn some more about ALAW's work. So um, Hannah, over to you. Thanks, Steph. Hi, everyone. I'm Hannah Darnell. I'm really pleased to, to be here tonight to chat to you about one of my favourite topics, which is animal law. Um, so as Kerry rightfully said, I am a Scottish solicitor based in Aberdeenshire and I'm currently focused on private law matters. Um, but I've always had a passion for animals and it wasn't until my legal traineeship when my passion for animals and my passion for the law really began to kind of overlap. Um, so I volunteered at my local animal sanctuary and I, I still do that now um, and at the time during my traineeship I was asked to intervene when um, to negotiate the, the rescue of a pig um, who was being held in an industrial pig farm. Um, so basically a whistle, whistleblower had identified um, the pig as being mistreated and the sanctuary wanted to intervene um, to, to make that rescue. So that was down to me and advocacy skills really came to the fore and I was able to negotiate her rescue um, with the owners, but they didn't make it very easy for me. Um, so they asked for a non-disclosure agreement to be put in place and for the pig to be collected within the hour, um, stating that she would be culled otherwise on the basis that she was suffering from mastitis, which obviously is an infection of the undercarriage area. Um, with the assistance of my supervising partner, I was able to draft the non-disclosure agreement there and then, put arrangements in place for the pig's rescue and transport. And the incident really made me realise, obviously it was a su successful outcome, but it made me realise that I could be doing an awful lot more for animals using the legal skills that I had um, to help them. And that's when I really became involved with the UK Centre for Animal Law. So... 
The area of Arnold Law is really wide ranging and so tonight's session will be quite high level introduction to the topic just to give you a flavour of what it's about and then Paula is going to follow me um, with an input about the actual work of the centre and how you can become involved in that. So we will start. Tiff, next slide, slide please. So we're going to start at the very beginning, very good place to start. And um, what is animal law? So there's actually no strict definition for animal law um, in UK legislation. Next slide, please, Tiff. There are definitions for different animals in specific acts and statutes, but there's no agreed definition for animal law itself. So in simple terms, animal law is the combination of legislation and case law that relates to or has an impact on non-human animals, okay? So that encompasses companion animals, for example, animals that tend to be kept as pets, cats and dogs, wildlife, animal used, animals used in entertainment and research, and animals raised for food, such as pigs, cows, chickens, for example. Next slide, please, Tiff. So now we look at animal law in practice. So animal law permeates through most traditional areas of the law. And while doing my research for the webinar, I came across a useful breakdown from the Animal Legal Defence Fund, which is a society based in California, um, which explained that animal law can feature in so many different areas of the law. So for example, environmental law in terms of factory farming, environmental pollution, climate change, fishing and wildlife, constitutional law in terms of civil liberties and animal advocacy, human rights and immigration. So this might be worker safety and human rights abuses on fishing boats, farms and slaughterhouses. Criminal law. So this would be, you know, animal cruelty prosecution, activist defences, um, links between animal abuse and violence towards humans and other crimes. International law in terms of wildlife poaching and trafficking. Um, delict or tort. So you know, malpractice by vets, damage for wrongful death or injury to a companion animal, for example. Um, family law, animal custody disputes and divorces and separations. Um, landlord and tenant law, so housing disputes involving pet policy, no pet policies and discrimination laws um, and, and so forth. Um, and also including consumer protection law, if we start to look at food safety, and food labelling and false advertising. And of course, then ent entertainment law, um, where you know captive wild animals and zoos, aquariums and films, for example. So you can see from that little list that you don't have to be an animal lawyer to be involved in animal law. Um, in my previous role, I assisted the litigation team with a challenge in a noise abatement order where a tenant um, was keeping a cockerel in their back garden in a residential street. Um, and I've also received um, a referral for work from a large charity to advise tenants on the law in terms of keeping pets in rented accommodation. So animal law really can arise in any setting and you just have to be open to the possibility of it. Next slide, please, Tiff. So why is animal law important? So as you can see there, animal rights and ethics, they teach us certain things um, that are wrong as a matter of principle. Um, but of course, we each have our own moral compass. Apart from certain footballers who think it's okay to kick cats. Um, so society, you know, generally love animals. Animals are a big part of our culture and the laws had to evolve to make provision for animals. Animal law can bring consequences for infringements and hold offenders to account but can also assist in resolving disputes involving animals. As you saw from the last slide, animal law can feature across so many different areas of the law. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna move on to talk a little bit about animal sentience. And the reason for this is that because the recognition of sentience in animals has had the greatest impact upon animal law for many years, and the law has had to evolve to reflect this. So what is animal sentience? So sentience means 
that animals have the capacity to experience positive and negative feelings, such as pleasure, joy, pain, and distress, that matter to the individual. Okay, and that's a quote from the RSPCA. And you'll also see from the slide the quote that a sentient animal is one for whom feelings matter. Okay, so the recognition of animal sentience has implications for all areas of human and animal interaction. If animals have feelings and emotions, then both their physical and their mental welfare needs should be taken into account with respect to laws, policies, and people's behaviour relating to animals and their welfare. Okay? Again, that's coming from the RSPCA. But this is a massive step forward in the animal welfare field. And many animal welfare advocates have been championing for this change and recognition of sentience for many years. Next slide, please. So now we're gonna have a look at what has prompted this change. So you can see here written down, when the UK was a member of the European Union, Article 13 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the EU um, recognised um, animal sentience and imposed the duty on member states to pay regard to their welfare requirements in formulating and implementing policy. When the Brexit transition period ended on the 1st of January 2021, this specific recognition of animal sentience fell out of UK law. So the UK government introduced the Animal Welfare Sentience Bill to the House of Lords on the 13th of May 2021 to remedy this. The bill recognises the sentience of animals and establishes a new committee to scrutinise government policy to consider whether policies will have an adverse impact on the welfare, welfare of animals as sentient beings. And as you can see, it covers England and Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, although it does not extend to the devolved competencies of the devolved administrations, which means that it will be reserved by the UK government. But we'll discuss the position in Scotland a wee bit later in the slides. Next slide, please, Steph. So moving into the finer details of the Animal Welfare Sentience Bill. So the bill will recognise all animals with a backbone, okay, vertebrates as sentient beings, and following a recent amendment, it will also include invertebrate animals, including decapod crustaceans, um, cephalopods who have complex central nervous systems, which is one of the hallmarks of sentience. Okay? Interestingly though, sentience itself is not defined in the bill. So the bill is currently at committee stage in the House of Commons, and this is where the detailed examination of the bill will take place. Obviously, we'll wait to hear more on that. But like I say, it's a big step and something that is most welcome. Next slide, please. So the UK Centre for Animal Law has been very much involved in discussions on the bill, um, including members of our Scottish steering group, Mike Radford, OBE, who's a reader at Aberdeen University, and Libby Anderson, who is formerly of the SSPCA and One Kind. I believe that Libby's listening in tonight, so hello to her. Um, so both Mike and Libby sit on, I'd say, the, the steering group. And you can see here from the slide, this is a slide that I've actually taken from a research briefing um, from the House of Commons Library um, from just a couple of weeks ago now. And you can see there that the, the centre obviously raised concerns about elements of the bill and will continue to do so as it progresses through. So we obviously play a very important part in feeding into um, legislation. Next slide, please. So the position in Scotland. So I'm here tonight obviously talking on behalf of the, the Scottish Young Lawyers Association. So I wanted to tailor my piece a little bit on the, giving you a quick summary about the position in Scotland. Um, Scotland has been very much at the forefront of change in animal welfare, and there's, there's actually so much to talk about. Um, but I'm just going to concentrate on a high-level summary tonight um, in hope that the Scottish Young Lawyers Association maybe ask us back again another time, and we can delve a little bit deeper into the topic. So in Scotland, we have the Animal Health and Wel Welfare Scotland Act 2006, um, this was introduced to amend the Animal Health Act of 1981, 
It makes provision designed to prevent the spread of disease, to make provision for the welfare of animals, and it includes the prevention of harm. Um, but interestingly, there's no explicit mention of animal sentience in the Act, but it does make reference to suffering, which includes physical and mental suffering. So in 2020, um, the Scottish Government set up the Scottish Animal Welfare Commission through regulations. And its remit is, includes considering how the welfare needs of sentient animals are being met by devolved policy okay? and possible legislative and non-legislative routes to further protect the welfare of sentient animals. The committee features a mix of personnel, so including those from the veterinary field, animal welfare, the world of science and academia. And they published a review of the Scottish Government activity affecting the welfare of animals as sentient beings in November 21, which is available for you to view online. Um, so we're fortunate that ALOS, Mike Radford and Libby Anderson, as I've previously mentioned, are also members of the Scottish Animal Welfare Committee. So that's fantastic for us. Um, and this really brings us nicely onto the topic of ALOS itself and um, how you can join us and become more involved in the work of ALOS should you wish to do so. Um, and I will also be very happy to answer any questions that you might have at the end of this session. So I am going to pass on to Paula, who is now going to speak to you about the centre in more depth. Oh, thank you very much, Anna. It's such, such an interesting presentation and gave me lots to think about. Um, and I think one of the most important points that you made is that the practice of animal law is so intersectional so uh, we sometimes have people contacting us saying you know I really want to practice in this area once I've graduated and think well it's a really difficult area to specialize in as one um, subject area and certainly for an early career professional I think it would be very difficult because you uh, it does cross so many areas and what we tend to see at the centre is people who practice in this area um, do so within part of a broader practice in say public law or in crime or within licensing so they need to carry a caseload that goes beyond the animal law cases they deal with um, now, there are exceptions, and so we have Advocates for Animals as the first specialist law firm that's been set up, and that's a really positive development. And they, I believe, gravitate more towards the public law side. Um, and I know that someone in the chat asked about the use of animals in experiments. And this is an area that is highly regulated under ASPA. And I think to practice in that area, you really do need to, to have a very thorough understanding of the regulations in, that, in, in this jurisdiction or whatever jurisdiction you're practicing in. And again, it's not just an understanding of the regulations and the substantive law, but how to use the law to gain information. So maybe how to draft really good, effective freedom of information applications how to use the ombudsman and the facilities that are available to you as a lawyer. Because, um, you know, as Hannah described, negotiation skills, they can be key. And these are the type of skills that we can bring from the profession to the types of problems that animal NGOs are experiencing in trying to improve the level or step up the level of protection for animals so I completely agree and in, endorse everything that, that Hannah says. Um, so a little bit about the centre and its work with the next slide please Tiffany. Thank you so this is our vision it's the world where animal interests are fully protected by law um, so we don't say animal welfare is um, fully met because animal welfare tends to be defined um, certainly in scientific terms, in a much more narrow way, whereas an, animal, an animal's interest may go beyond its welfare. It may relate to its life or it may relate to um, the needs of the species. It may relate to the needs for habitat. And that's why we say that we are concerned about the protection of those interests and not simply improving welfare standards. 
Next, please, Tiffany. So how do we do this? We promote knowledge and education about the law relating to animal protection. And we want to see both a better legal framework. So there are structural issues that can make it difficult to ensure that um, the law is applied properly. And um, we want to see that where there are laws, that those laws are implemented and enforced. So we want to see good, strong, robust laws, but we also want to make sure they're actually being effective on the ground. Tiffany? Thank you. And what's the legal landscape? Um, for us, as we've mentioned, is the um, fact that animal welfare law is not developed as a practice area yet in the same way that environmental law is. There are still only a small number of public law cases each year, although we did, you know, there have been a few. Um, and over the last year, we've just seen the recent uh, case in Scotland around badger protection, which is great, um, but certainly scope potentially for more of those. And also the fact that animal law is still only taught in a small number of law schools that offer an animal law module. And this is something that we would like to see rolled out more widely so that students who are interested in this area, and we do hear from um, quite a high number of students who are interested in this, have the chance to learn about it. And I think that's important to have that as an option because this is such an important area. Uh, next slide, please. So how do we work? Just a quick summary. We work with animal advocacy groups helping to um, uh, who are helping to, who are helping to bring cases that raise uh, public uh, important principles of law. We develop resources about animal law. We have forums to discuss the issues around animal law ethics and policy. Uh, we produce materials for students, particularly useful, I think, for students who are not able to access teaching through their universities. And we provide expert legal issue input on public policy issues. Uh, so by drafting briefing papers and responding to consultations where we feel we can add value as a legal organisation. Next, please. So facilitating access to justice. Sometimes this is just about signposting to the appropriate uh, forum for legal help. So we, that may be making a referral to a solicitor, or it may be through our team of legal volunteers who carry out pro bono work to help on particular campaigns or with particular legal issues. Uh, we may be um, drafting briefing papers that approach an issue from a legal point of view rather than a policy or campaigning point of view. So if we feel that we can add value, we will do. If it's simply adding our voice to a popular campaign, then often we don't do that because we don't have the on the ground experience. And so we do like to limit our involvement to those areas where we feel we can add something as well as providing training to groups about how to use the law. So those areas like defamation and freedom of information and those also soft law areas and complaints procedures and so on. So next slide, please, thank you. This is a report that we um, uh, coordinated, we didn't draft, we coordinated this with the Wildlife and Countryside Link Group. And the content actually came from the animal charities themselves, and we had over 40 signatories to this report. It was launched in Parliament in 2018 as we were going through the Brexit process, and it identifies um, areas that uh, could represent a challenge for animals after leaving the European Union, or areas where there are opportunities to do things better. And so this report, which is available uh, free to read online, showcases really those, um, those, those key areas of risk and opportunity. Next, please. In 2021, just to give you an idea of the sorts of areas that we've worked on through our volunteer team, we uh, published policy papers either as briefing papers or in response to consultations on exotic um, pet ownership, on keeping primates as pets. And you may remember there was a consultation about that. That's now being um, addressed through a licensing system through the Kept Animals Bill. 
the use of animals in research is another area that we uh, fed in uh, to a committee on some work about that. Live animal exports. We're currently involved in a project on enforcement of animal welfare law and gene editing. And we have been concerned with proposals around gene editing that that will um, perpetuate some of the issues that we've seen with selective breeding resulting in poor welfare for those animals subject to that, such as the broiler chickens. Next slide, please. We have now four specialist interest groups, as well as our Scotland committee that Hannah kindly mentioned and which is doing fantastic work. Um, but also, I think for Scotland as well, it's been a really good forum to get to know people who are interested in the area and get to talk to them. It can feel very isolating as a practitioner when you have um, a real keenness about an area and you want to learn more and you want to talk to people and you know find out what they think about things and to share what you feel about different issues so I think it also provides that sense of community and it's really through our specialist interest groups that we are able to have the outreach we do and produce the work that we do um, at policy level with those consultation responses and briefing papers and so on. Next slide please. Um, so our seminars and training events, I've already mentioned, we run those um, for um, lawyers, but also for uh, campaigning groups and charities. And we provide that training on issues around the areas that people are working on around campaign law, as I've mentioned, as well as in some occasions, substantive animal welfare law, or it may be around trade, or those areas that um, are important to understand in a particular sector. Next slide, please. Uh, this was our um, Animal Law Ethics and Policy Conference. We've been holding these uh, once every two years. Um, and uh, in fact, I think we're probably holding them annually or we'll move towards holding them annually. This year, the huge big news is that it's uh, the 200 year anniversary of the very first animal anti-cruelty legislation in UK and possibly in the world. There's a query about whether an, uh, a, a, a district got in first in, in the United States, and, uh, but certainly in this jurisdiction, it's the um, it was the first and that was Martin's Act of 1822. So we're having a really big celebration. Um, we're going to be holding a five day, she says, wincing conference online, celebrating animal law, but also looking at the pathway ahead. What do we want to achieve? How can we get there? What can we do better? And we want to make this a very global event and look at the situation facing animals across the world and so look out for that coming between the 18th and 22nd of July to coincide with the anniversary of the um, act passing. Thank you Tiffany. This is our journal so we have the only journal of animal law I think in the UK and it's dedicated to animal law and policy so we try to put case reports in there, keep people up to date and current with news uh, but it also features academic articles that are peer reviewed by academics and practitioners in the area. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, we also supplement this with our digital news board, which is actually a microsite on our website. And this hosts uh, blog articles and news about animal law. And we also encourage our student members and other members to uh, write for the blog, to talk about issues that are interesting and concerning to them and I think it gives people an opportunity to actually get published in this area to practice those skills that are going to be so useful as a practitioner um, or in academia because very often you know you might want to get published but you don't have the skills yet to publish an academic paper but writing a blog article or contributing to a magazine is a really good way to um, engage with the topic and also um, to um, explore your views with other people. Thank you Tiffany. So Tiffany runs our student outreach program, she runs our student group and she has um, increased our student ambassador numbers to I think nearly 30 now across the UK and our student ambassadors promote knowledge about animal law and coordinate events um, on campus and represent a law 
They offer a way for students to get involved with writing and research about animal law. And we also provide videos and other materials and resources to help people who actually want to learn about this area. A number of these you'll find also on our website. Thank you, Tiffany. Uh, we run an annual national essay competition. We're about to launch uh, this year's. Um, the winner will be announced at the Martins Law Conference in July. Uh, but we um, uh, set a different uh, title each year and invite people to send in their essays and the winning essay, as well as attracting a cash prize, gets published in the actual journal itself. So that's a really good opportunity to get published in a peer review journal. Uh, next slide, please is the National Animal Law Moot. So this is our legal debating competition that was founded by one of our student ambassadors in 2019. And in fact, in our uh, following competition in 2020 to 21, uh, that moved online for the finals, we had over 100 competitors from seven different universities. And the uh, finals were held online. We have a short video on our website uh, from the event. It was a really great fun day, actually. I think the judges who were drawn from the legal profession really enjoyed it too. So um, you know, it was a really good, good, good day and a good way for people to be exposed to the area and learn about uh, topics relating to animals in a socio-legal context. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, we also support student to universities who want to offer animal law courses, so we have information on our website about the universities that do offer those modules, and we set up an animal law uh, teachers group so that people who are teaching in this area can um, share um, knowledge. And next slide please. We also have information about careers on our website and there are uh, at least two, possibly three webinars now that have been held recently looking at different aspects of uh, careers involving animals. So in our first webinar that's online, we talked to, to three practitioners who incorporated some elements of animal law within a much broader practice. And in our last webinar, we looked at academic practices, including criminal criminology, which is a really interesting area and gives quite a bit of scope to actually research areas around um, dog breeding, wildlife, ecocide, really fascinating and important topics. And we also feature a lot of this content on our Animal Law TV channel on YouTube. Uh, so we have that content is freely available to everyone. And some of our um, uh, early career professional members have set up the Young Animal Lawyers Network. Uh, so if anyone wants to join that, that's for postgraduates up to five years PQE, anyone who wants to just, you know, get in touch with other people, share information, maybe, um, you know, facilitate further pro bono and voluntary work, I think they're planning a book club, training events and all sorts of things. So fantastic. We're really looking forward to that getting off the ground. Thanks, Tiffany. Uh, this is our Animal Law TV channel, and I would recommend if you're new to the area, starting with the bite size series that we ran over lockdown, you can see here again featuring our very own Libby and our very own Mike, some fantastic talks about animal law. Libby talked about wildlife, uh, Mike talked about the Animal Welfare Act, we also had Joe Wills, uh, Stephen McCulloch talking about political representation, it was great. It's fine, Tiffany, you can go straight on to the podcast. We can, we can end with the podcast. This is our, our newest initiative, Talking Animal Law. I think it sounds great, doesn't it? So we uh, broadcast this every two weeks, have a new episode, and we cover current issues. It's only about 30 minutes an episode, so it's quite easy to just you know put it on in the background while you're doing something and enables people to just um, engage again with topics around animal law, what's going on in Parliament. Um, our last episode was actually about the um, beaver case in Scotland. So that's a, that's a very topical, very topical one. And the uh, episode before that was um, really to mark the work of Sir David Amos and everything that he did for animals in Parliament. And we've also had episodes about, um, um, you know, the, the current bills that are going through Parliament and we're due to have some uh, good ethical uh, speakers come and talk to us as well. So 
um, please do subscribe on your regular podcast channel and follow us. That would be great. Um, and I think we're done today. Yes, yeah, so we're over to the chat. I can see all these questions popping up in the chat as I'm speaking. So I'm so pleased that uh, there are questions. Thank you both. Sorry, I had myself on mute. Um, thank you so much. I think I tend to forget just how, more, how much work is going on in the charity until you sit down and explain everything. But there's lots, lots of moving pieces and um, such a huge volunteer team behind AILA to be able to bring all of these opportunities and resources to people. So um, I will get into the questions. Um, just to, I'll give everyone a minute to kind of have a think about their questions. And I just want to ask you both a question um, mm -hmm. for, I suppose, young animal lawyers or, or young lawyers who maybe want to get into animal law. Um, what is a, a piece of advice or maybe something that you would tell them kind of early on if, if they want to move their career in that way or, or have animal law involved in their career in some capacity? Everyone wants oh, that's to a go. good one. Um, well, obviously, I touched upon my own experience um, in my input, and and that really was that it, you know, I wasn't focused on animal law. That wasn't my focus at the time, and um, but basically, I was able to still use my skills to, you know, to to make a difference. Um, so I would say keep it, keep an open mind, um, really, because it might well be that you're going into or you, you've kind of, your interest lies in a certain area of the law. It could be litigation, it could be commercial, it could be private client, um, but there are still possibilities within that for you to become involved um, in animal law through your job, but also there could be something external that you can do in your free time, which would also bolster your experience. Um, so for example, I'm the um, crime and advocacy advisor to the trustees at Scottish Badgers. Um, so that allows me to write um, consultation responses for them. Um, we do quite a lot of them. I have also been um, in negotiations with our other organisations on their behalf. Um, I also use um, some planning experience that I've gained um, from previous roles. I use that to help community groups um, to object to planning applications. And um, we've recently just prepared a case that's going to the court of session later on in the year. Um, so it doesn't just have to come down to your paying job. Um, there's, there's so much you can do in your own time um, on a voluntary basis, if you're willing and able to do that, to bolster your experience and, and really make a difference for animals. Paula, have you got anything you'd like to add to that? What she said. <laughs> And I, com I completely agree with everything. Uh, the only thing I would add is, and again, I, I think it chimes with what you said, actually, that I think gravitate to what really interests you in law. If you want to be a criminal practitioner, be the best criminal practitioner you can be. If you want to be a licensing lawyer or if that's the opportunity that you have, then go for it. Don't think, oh, no, that, that's not quite going to work for the work I want to do with animals because you don't know how you can use and develop those skills. I mean, we had a really fantastic licensing lawyer who didn't specialise at all in animals, but was able to really help constructively with the puppy farming um, work because she knew licensing, she knew the system, she knew how it all fit together. So she was able to apply her skills in that way. And it was really helpful. And she's continued helping and volunteering. You know, you might find that crime's your thing, then that's what you've got to do and then see how you can incorporate that further down the line. But you've got to have those skills to begin with. And I think to get those skills, you have to really enjoy what you're doing too. Excellent, thank you both. Um, there was one comment in the Q&A box on religious slaughter. Um, we do have a podcast episode on this, so we can pop it into the chat for you to have a listen. It's um, with Paula and Dr. Joe Wills. It's quite an interesting podcast episode, um, so we can pop it. Yeah, go ahead, Paula. Joe Wills is fantastic on this topic, and he's written on this topic, and the podcast interview was really interesting as well. He speaks so eloquently. 
And he spoke to one about one of the recent cases from Europe that um, is much more positive. So we'll see. But I think it's also worth bearing in mind that animals are not always stunned or stunned properly for other reasons as well. So this is a much wider discussion. Um, we were talking about, and Anna was talking about the crustaceans, lobsters being stunned, they have no protection currently or nothing that's effective. And that's why we see them placed in pots of boiling water. So there has to be a much broader discussion about slaughter as well and protection at the time of slaughter. There, there is regulation and there is some protection, but some animals fall outside of that and sometimes the, um, there are compromises as to the best approach as a matter of science because of the economic viability of putting those protections in place. So, you know, those are all areas that have to be looked at critically, I would suggest. Thank you, Paula. Um, a message and question from Libby. Um, Libby said, thanks for the um, two great roundups of current, of, sorry, of the current agenda. What do you think we can do to promote greater protection for wildlife welfare under Scottish and UK law? Um, welfare of the individual always lags behind conservation and health of the populations, um, but this overlooks sentience. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this really is good question. From, and this from is Libby what Libby's, and Libby's doing so well. It's the Wild Animal Welfare Committee. They're doing such fantastic work. It, I think it is about um, raising awareness and and knowledge. Um, you know, from a, a general perspective, I think. But you know, I agree that you know what what Paul is saying is that um, the people are at the heart of it. You know, such as you know the the commission. Um, and also ourselves at, at AWOL to an extent, because obviously we are also feeding into the legislation whenever possible. Um, but also what I found is that, you know, anyone can have a bit of a voice because you can, you know, you can complete a consultation response. You know, if a, if a government consultation comes up, you can get your viewpoint across um, at that time and, and, you know, put in what you think um, you know, should be done to you know, to help with these, with certain matters, um, I would say. I, I agree with you, Hannah. I think as well, making connections with um, environmental lawyers and groups and that, that community that I think has traditionally seen wildlife as this homogenous mass, whereas in fact, it's very much about the individuals protection of individual habitat or other areas about individual animal welfare that are overlooked and conservation is the primary driver for much of the legislation that exists and so far as it does exist to protect animals and there needs to be um, a shift so that it's much more animal centric. Mm -hmm. um, could I pick up this question please Tiff? I see one here from um, Richie and it says are there any legal protections that can be put in place to try and limit the number of animals that get killed on motorways so obviously this is a real passion of mine um, it's something that I've put, put something in place myself because it's you know you see so many animals killed on the, our, our local roads I think I did some research and it was around 15,000 animals are killed every year on UK roads. Um, and in terms, it's a very good question about, you know, what legal protection, protections can actually be put in place to prevent this. And it's something that I've been in discussion with our own local council about, um, because I had argued that there needed to be more wildlife road signs. And they came back, the senior road, en road engineer, and told me that people don't look at road signs and, uh, and therefore they, they weren't going to look at wildlife road signs because they don't look at any road signs. Um, and they, they argued that there should be um, some sort of barriers put in place to obviously prevent wildlife from crossing habitats, which is ridiculous. Um, but, you know, I completely agree with you that if there is a legal solution, I'm going to be the person to find that <laughs> um, because, you know, I think it's 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 a really key point. Um, you know, like, like I say, 15,000 animals, you know, every year um, killed on the roads. And, you know, from a personal perspective, 
shameless plug, I um, set up a little business um, for wildlife first response kits so that you can have in your car so that if you do come across um, an injured animal or a deceased animal, then you can take the correct action. Um, so I'm totally with you on that. Um, as far as legal protections go, I don't have anything to suggest at the time. Um, like I say, I'm currently doing some um, freedom of information requests to try and see what the level of um, wildlife road signs is across the country um, to try and understand if, you know, the hotspot areas are covered um, and also working with um, Project Splatter, um, which is a University of Bristol project that um, documents the level of wildlife killed in our roads and again to sort of identify the hotspot area. So it's a work in progress, Richie. And um, if you have any ideas, absolutely, by all means, let us know. Um, but yeah, definitely a person, personal passion of mine. Um, anything that, that you can add to that, Paula? No, I think you said everything there, Hannah. Excellent, yeah. thank you, Hannah. Thanks so much. Um, we have a question. So they say, um, is there difficulty to obtaining funding to raise these issues in court, et cetera, compared to private client criminal work where clients can fund their own cases or receive legal aid? Yeah, there can be. Um, sorry, Paul, I'm jumping in here. Yeah. But um, I think that there can be because certain organizations can find it difficult um, to, you know, to get the funding. And what I found in my experience is you know, having represented a, a voluntary association is that they can't apply for funding because they're a voluntary association. And um, what's had to be done in that situation is that we've had to identify someone in the group who will raise the, the action on behalf of the group and they are then entitled to legal aid. Um, and so it's a kind of real roundabout way of doing it. Um, but I know that it's it's something that certainly a few organisations have, have done and it's you know perfectly above board and legal. Um, that advice came from the um, Environmental Rights Centre for Scotland. Um, so I, yeah, it can be difficult, but not impossible is what I would say to that. I think I would echo that as well from the experience of talking to the groups and looking at the landscape for litigation, particularly for judicial review. Mm. There is some creativity about uh, raising funds if they're needed. So crowdfunding has been a popular and successful route to raise money. I think one of the barriers is the uh, costs liability that you may be facing at each stage and even if you can cover your own costs ensuring that you can cost, cover the other side's costs if you're not successful have to withdraw is a big issue particularly for many small groups and that can potentially have a bit of a chilling effect um, so it's mm. a mixed picture but it is a factor. Yeah that's right you can put in for a protective expenses order mm. um, and obviously that that goes some way to, to helping but yeah, it's um, it's tricky, but a combination of you know trying to obtain the legal aid, um, or as Paula mentioned, you know crowdfunding um, to raise the legal fees, um, it can be done if it if it needs to be. Perfect, thank you. Um, a question here about the status of fox hunting. Um, don't know if either of you want to touch on this. Um, the Hunting Act hunts in place? It's a difficult one, isn't it? I mean, the legislation's in place, enforcement is difficult, it's a challenge, it's a challenge in rural areas where there you know, isn't necessarily always the scrutiny. Um, is there the political will to amend the Hunting Act? Um, and, you know, is enough being done to look at the areas around hunting where, um, you know, sort of keep hunting going. It's, it's, it's a really tricky one. It's not an area in which we've been terribly involved because the campaign groups doing the work on the ground, you know, are working very hard on this. Um, Hannah, did you want to add anything? Um, it, yeah, I mean, it's, a, it's an awful situation. Um, and obviously there are a lot of really good, um, you know, groups and not-for-profits out there who are, you know, trying to do everything that they can. Um, from a personal perspective, I just recently um, did a consultation response on hunting with dogs. 
um, to get the viewpoint across. So that was on behalf of Scottish Badgers, um, because you know anything that really impacts upon, you know, a fox, then you know potentially has the same, um, you know, possibility to affect badgers. And um, so I think it is, it's, it's going to take a bit to change things, but it's, you know, it's it's got to happen. Um, and I think it is just a case of keep feeding in um, into it to, to you know reporting these hunts and um, and there's some really great groups out there. Um, obviously, you've got your hunt sabs as well who are doing fantastic work um, to do what they can to to stop them. Excellent, thank you both. Um, there was a few questions about getting involved um, as a student and then also as a non-student. Um, I can just answer very quickly that, yeah, if, if you're a student, absolutely, we would love for you to get involved in the student group. Um, I've popped my email in the chat for anybody who does want to reach out and get involved as a student ambassador um, to host webinars and events or uh, whatever you might like to do with your skills. And um, equally, you don't have to be a, a lawyer um, or a student or anybody kind of in this, this you know, specific field to get involved in ALA. So yeah, again, please feel free to, to reach out to my email and I can filter you on to, um, if it's not the student group, um, to whomever I can to, to get you involved in our work. Um, I don't think there's any other questions. I'll, I'll give a, a final call for questions. We've had some lots of interesting observations and that, that's really fantastic to see people with engaging and interested in, in this area and in this topic and wanting to do more. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Um, and if anything comes to mind post webinar, um, please feel free to, like I say, to send an email and we can um, answer your questions or, or help as best we can. Yeah, I, I guess. We can end here, Carrie, and, and I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Tiffany. Um, so just to say a, a huge thank you to all of our panel tonight for such a thought-provoking and really engaging presentation. Um, I'm sure everyone here tonight has taken away some, some really great information, um, and I'm sure some of our, our attendees will be really keen to get involved with the work of ALO, um, so, so thank you all very much. Um, Hannah, I'm really keen to hear about your, your business as well, so please uh, pop, the, pop the link yeah. in the chat, um, because it's oh, yeah, definitely sure. something that I, gosh, I can't tell you how many times, sadly, I wish I had something like that in my car. So please pop the, the details in the in the chat. Um, and, you know, I'm sure we would love to have you back to hear um, a little bit more about animal law in Scotland and to really do a deep dive into that. So, yeah, so thank you all very much. Um, and thank you also, Tiffany, for, for running our Q&A session this evening. That was a nice little break for me. Um, if anyone does have any further questions, um, I am going to pop the, uh, Tiffany's details just back into the chat um sorry i'm going to do this at the same time as talking and i'm also going to pop a link to the alo website as well where you can find out all of the information um that you could need um there's links there to the the youtube channel as well which i highly recommend everyone to have a look at i had a little watch of it and there's there's some really great um videos on there so i highly recommend that um so before the evening concludes, um, just a reminder to anyone um, who is a member of SYLA um, that we do have a number of other great events coming up um, over the next few weeks. Um, and I'm going to pop a link to our Eventbrite page where you will find um, full details there. Okay, so to conclude, um, I hope you hope all of our attendees this evening have enjoyed the event. Um, and just once again, thank you so much to all of our panelists um, for your assistance in organising the event and for your really wonderful presentations. Mm, uh, just to say, hope everyone enjoys the rest of your evening and thank you very much and take care. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Kerry. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Bye. Bye.